All right, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Wellness Cafe. Today we have Tim J P Collins of the Anxiety Podcast with us. Welcome, Tim. Hey, how you doing? I am well. How about yourself? Fabulous. Happy to be here. All right. Where are you located right now? I am on the beautiful island of uh, Vancouver Island, actually in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, that's awesome! Over the yeah. border, Can- Canada side. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just there like I want to say six weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, there was a conference there with Dr. Ed Osborne. He's a chiropractic mentor of mine. Got it. Yeah, it's cool. Beautiful place. So, for our listeners who are not familiar with you and your story, can you share a bit mm-hmm. about um, your story and how essentially you you took a turn in your life by just yeah honoring your story and your healing journey yeah um so somebody the other day said this term to me which is that we we die twice effectively and um but you could look at it as though that we're born twice i think for me is that you know the first time i was born obviously was when uh i was a baby but the second time i think is when i got some awareness in my life in terms of where i was going wrong and for me i had kind of buried the way I felt for so long in my life, I kind of just been going through the motions in terms of making a lot of money and chasing the traditional approach of success, I suppose, which I was very good at. I was very good at sales. I was very good at making money. Um, but I was doing it at the detriment of my own well-being. Both physical and mental health were not a priority. Um, I didn't eat well. I drank a lot of alcohol. I ate crappy food. I traveled a lot. And so all of those things combined – um, over years compounded. This wasn't uh, a quick thing. Um, you know, people often want a quick fix for stress and anxiety, but they didn't get into it in a fast way. And, and I didn't either. So yeah, over time that stuff built up and then eventually got to the stage where it just, it just made me stop and pay attention. Yeah. And, and did you always have anxiety or was it something just slowly built up like what you said? Yeah, I think uh, I think I was always a sensitive person um, because I believe that people with anxiety, sensitive people have superpowers, um, extra sensory perception in terms of them being very aware, often too aware to their to their detriment at some point. Um, so yeah, I was always sensitive. It was always um, kind of suppressed in terms of. I never put myself under so much pressure that I snapped, but then when I did, it 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 came out to show itself. Mm. Yeah. And the second part of that, the second part of that is to say that um, I don't think I also don't see it as like a chronic disorder where people say I have like generalized anxiety disorder and that's my fate forever. I can't leave the house or I have to take this medication. I don't agree with that. I believe that we can change our minds we can change the way we feel and uh not not to like cure it or eradicate it but basically to say like this is part of me and i'm gonna i'm gonna use it as a strength and not as a weakness right and you said you were doing really good in the conventional way right the societal way of like um getting sales and excelling in your career essentially and Mm. and how i guess how did that like coexist simultaneously how were you able to um i guess cope with anxiety and also did you just turn it off and just excel and then once you come home to your um yourself and you start to have that that again Mm -hmm. well pre my meltdown which i'll tell you about in a minute um before that i think i just kind of intuitively covered it up i'm not sure that's the right way to use intuition but um when I went out to like business functions or conferences or sales meetings, I would often that would often be in a bar or in a restaurant. And after a couple of beers, I was funnier. I was better at sales. People liked me more. And so I just turned it on and, and had a couple of drinks and that seemed to work well. Um, what happened when, when it actually kind of came to a peak is I f- I'd flown uh, on a plane. I'd got to England actually where I was doing a presentation. I stayed up very late, went out drinking which was kind of like the badge of honor back in those days was to go out and get shit faced and then get up early for work the next day, go into the office stinking of booze with a hangover and just still 
do a good job, still perform. Um, and I'd done that many times before. But on this occasion, I stood up at the front of the room. I started to look around at the projector and started to do my presentation. And I had like an Eminem choke moment where I just fucking forgot what I was going to say, lost my words. And, uh, and I had a panic attack, the first ever panic attack I had on the spot. Um, I thought I was having a heart attack. I started sweating. I started shaking. And it kind of just overtook me where I was like on autopilot of survival. I couldn't, I couldn't regain control. And I think in the past I'd had kind of classic nervousness before speaking where I, and then once I got into it, it went away, the usual thing. This time it was like, no, you're, we are taking your legs out because you haven't been paying attention to the warning signs. And so that was kind of like a, a turning point in my life where I didn't, it didn't allow me to fix it immediately, but it was like, all right, now it's got bad enough that you have to pay attention. So, right, right. And I guess it's a breaking point because your body will take a beating for, for a while with, you know, toxins, right. with chemicals, you can eat bad food for a long time before the symptoms start to show up. Right. Mm. So, um, I guess the next question would be, um, after that, like what went through your mind and, and what actually mm -hmm. allowed you to make that next decision? Yeah. I mean, as you said, I think that anxiety is a, is a reflection of how out of alignment we are in our lives. Often people will come to me in my coaching practice and say, I'm having panic attacks at work or I can't get on an airplane or I can't do interviews or I'm finding it in my relationship. And the truth is, is that those manifestations of anxiety stem from somewhere else. They started somewhere else. That's just the result. That's the output. So the challenge is to find out where it came from, which the truth is, is that people complicate the shit out of it. But the truth is, a lot of it is self-belief, self-worth and confidence is the underlying um, base of a lot of people's anxiety. They're very hard on themselves. They mm. care a lot about what people think and therefore they put themselves under more pressure. Um, so after that sort of panic attack for me, I went into a bit of a dark place where I thought about ending it all. Um, but And then I kind of went into survival mode, like struggle mode where I'd go into work every day. I'd be feeling it in my stomach. I'd be sat in meetings I remember I used to sit in like board meetings in the office and um, I would just sit there and flex my calf muscles as much as I could so that they hurt um, and kind of create that own pain for myself so that it distracted me from what was going on in my head, which was like, you know, telling me to run, telling me to get out of the room, telling me not to be there. And uh, and so, yeah, that was tough um, for a long time. And I, I, uh, I, I, joke um a little bit about a story something that happened to me when i was in that situation i was interviewing somebody i was the vice president of sales and i was interviewing this individual and halfway through the interview i started panicking i started sweating and i was the boss right um which was hugely ironic which is what fueled it because i was like i can't be sweating i'm the fucking i'm doing the interview this is ridiculous <laughs> but i started sweating and they noticed which made it worse um And so, yeah, it was showing up in, in work in real life. I'd be sat in with a CEO in having a chat about the business and I'd just be like, I got to go and just walk out. So, mm. um, again, because I was good at my job, people just kind of overlooked it. People just looked past it and said, oh, Tim's having a bad day. Nobody said like anxiety, panic attack. People were just like, he's obviously stressed or something. Stress, right. Stressed is, is, I think, like the socially acceptable word for anxiety sometimes. Right. Um, where it's clearly not just natural stress, it's actually like a, a debilitating condition which you need to uh, put some attention to. So yeah, that was that. It took a while for me to actually do anything about it. I just suffered for a while. Right. I mean, I just want to share a bit about my own personal experience with anxiety and whatnot. I mean, um, there were times that. And, then, and this is just a personal experience that I was, I guess, fear. I was fearful of the future. It was right about the time that I was about to graduate uh, chiropractic school. And I just didn't know what the world was, was like, right? I just, And I had this fear, the imminent fear that it was not going to work out for me. It, 
it was right. not going to work out for me. And then I couldn't stop that loop, that negative loop. It just keeps on saying that in my head over and over again. My heart raced. And I think that was like an episode for myself. So um, how much of that is just coming from the mind? And if you're able to train the mind to think differently or break the pattern, would that mm. help? Or did you find that helpful at all? Did you use any of the method like that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways for people to fix their anxiety. Um, there's a lot of different approaches I use in my practice when I'm working with groups or business people or whoever it is. But um, the truth is, is that m most people, the, the conventional system is go to the doctor, the doctor will give you a pill, you take the pill and you'll be fixed. Um, Prozac or something like that, yeah. Yeah, and and studies tell us and research tells us that there's never it's never been proven that there is any chemical imbalance in the brain which causes th these types of problems and so what happens with medication is a lot of people just get the side effects it numbs them out a bit so they become kind of zombified hmm. um, and they just feel less overall it doesn't actually fix the problem and so for me it's kind of like i always say like stop coping and start changing because the coping techniques aren't helping you um, it's changing, which makes the difference. So, uh, whether it's kind of overthinking things, whether it's something in your life that's going on, I often use the kind of term of embracing anxiety. So how do we, as opposed to like avoiding it and trying to bypass it, how do we lift it up, tuck it under our arm and say, this is part of the process It's good that I feel something. It means that I care about the future. It means that I care about the work I'm going to mm -hmm. do. Listen, if you weren't anxious about being a chiropractor or you're going to go and stand on stage and give a talk and you don't feel a little, uh, nervous about it, you shouldn't be doing it because it that means that you don't care. So I believe that it's often a, a barometer of significance. And as Seth Godin says, you know, we should we should use the anxiety as a compass to move towards, not away from. It means that you're onto something, right? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think a, a lot of people just use it as a reason to to stay small, to play small, to not do the next big thing, to not launch the business or ask the girl out or whatever it is. When the truth is that, you know, we're, we're, we're so in, introspective in terms of looking at ourselves and, you know, nobody else is looking. It's just us worrying about something small inside. Right. And um, back to that point of, medication is just masking it zombifying it almost right take people away from from knowing themselves because as you were saying anxiety that feeling and that feeling in the stomach it is a sign it's physical mm. right so if you actually right. embrace it and go in inward and feel it and maybe get to know it more understand it why this thing's going on inside of me embracing it instead of just trying to smash it with with pills i right. think it's like it's yeah. like having a fire alarm a fire alarm's going off in your house and you go and unplug it or you go and smash it off the wall or you throw a blanket over it like it's it's trying to fucking tell you something you can quieten it um which is what medication does for for most people it quietens the noise but it doesn't solve the problem it just you know even and i always say like even if medication didn't have any side effects and it did make you feel better and it actually had like healthy vitamins in it it still wouldn't be good for you because it's still not allowing you to address what made you feel that way in the first place so it's a totally flawed concept and did you find that like for example um when you kind of come to a grip that you you yourself have anxieties as a as society we we look away we with with these type of issues we almost kind of bundle mm -hmm. them up like you said in stress and i would imagine for females it it would have been harder to to at least I guess get acknowledged that hey there's something going on here. You almost just get into put into this like female category. Oh, she's just a woman. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, it's it's hard for everybody, female or male. It mm -hmm. could be you could say it's hard for men because of the stigmatize and his weakness, and you're <laughs> you're not tough enough, and you should man up and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's hard for women because people might say, well, they're just being emotional. The reality is, is that you. You know, it, it can affect anybody at any age based on what's going on in your life at that point. Um, some people say 
individuals could be genetically predisposed. Um, but again, the, the work is the same. The result is the same, which is like, what are you choosing in your life? Um, and and it's it comes down to that choice. You get to create your future. Um, your life isn't happening to you. It's happening for you. So what do you want? What intentional action do you want to take? And this comes down to simple stuff like, are you going to go to the gym today? And are you going to eat the piece of broccoli or are you going to eat the cheeseburger? Like it's all, you know comes from a, a macro thing, which is the way you feel, down to a micro thing, which is like, what's the what's the next step today? Mm. Right, and when you work with like, for example, like clients and, and coaching and group coaching that you do, um, I guess the first step for them would be to be aware of it, right? And reframe that and uh, embrace it, yeah. make it more powerful instead of weakness. And right. what, what's the next step? Like, do you take them through some type of exercises? Yeah, I mean, it's very, um, it's, it's very individual and right. it's very similar at the same time, which is a bit of a contradiction. But each person I work with, I, I, I understand their specific story because their story got them to be and feel the way they are today. So that's important. Um, but the reason that everybody's the same is that every single person I speak to is, number one, they're resisting it. So they're fighting it. And anxiety loves to fight. It'll fight all day long. It doesn't need to sleep. It's a 19-year-old Mike Tyson is going to beat the crap out of you, right? Um, and 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 on some level, what we're doing when we're, when we're fighting it is we're fighting a part of ourselves. We're rejecting a part of our own being. And this, again, loses people sometimes because it sounds a little bit spiritual. But um, in order to overcome anxiety we need to fully embrace it we need to embrace you know the good the bad the scared um the courageous all the different parts of us um but yeah everybody's fighting it and everybody's very hard on themselves i've never met anybody with anxiety that isn't hard on themselves doesn't beat themselves up and say i'm weak i should be stronger i should be this i should be that so for me it's it's working on the, the individual or the group of people as to understand you know how did they get to be this way in the first place? And mm -hmm. then how do we rebuild their confidence? How do we instill some some strength in them so that they can, you know, start to take the next step? And that then incorporates nutrition, exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I call it micro exposure. So what can what things can you do every day that you're a little bit scared of that move you towards the mm -hmm. end goal? Um, and I believe that unlike kind of quick fixes, I believe that permanent change takes time. So it's kind of like, what's the next thing that you need to do on your journey to improve? And the the reality is that most of the people who come and work with me, they've already tried talk therapy, they've already tried medication, they've already tried buying online courses, they've tried all this stuff, and it didn't work for them, because it wasn't change, it was coping. And so I'm all about, like, how do we actually create a difference in your life to, to move you from this path onto the, the one which is more aligned. Yeah, and it's a marathon. Um, like you mentioned, yeah. it took them 15, 20, 30, 40 years to get to that breaking point. And it's right. going to take more than just three pills or a, a three-day um, courses, right? Yeah, it took me. it probably took me like a couple of years to feel better. And mm. then... Um, a couple of years of work to feel better. And then I'm still growing and evolving all the time. I mean, my confidence is is super good now because that's what I work on all the time. It's what I build on. But I still, you know, one of the analogies I use is that when I had anxiety, it was like my house was built on sand. So when it got windy outside and rainy, my house would fall over, meaning I would have a panic attack. I would collapse and, and kind of fail. Um, what I've done over time is I've, I've basically like, right, move the house out of the way. I've poured cement foundation. I've put steel rods in there. And so um, my foundation is much stronger. My house is much stronger, but it still gets windy outside. It still rains, meaning, you know, there's still shit in my life sometimes that happens. Um, life never stops. Or yeah. Personal or wherever, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's about how do you roll with that and how do you deal with it? Um, as opposed to trying to fix external things, just work on you. Mm, yeah, definitely. And do you do any type of meditation or journaling? Yeah, so 
meditation for me, I sometimes do act. I kind of class it as active and passive. So active meaning I'll sit there and do a, um, just have quiet time with music where I'll focus on something or I'll do guided meditation. I think there's lots of different good styles out there. Um, and then like passive meditation, I, I'll ride on my mountain bike oh, down yeah. by the ocean and just like look out to sea and just kind of clear my mind and let go of things. And I also find it like when I'm working out and lifting weights, I also find that quite um, cathartic in terms of just kind of focusing on the lift or focusing on the, the you know, whatever the exercise I'm doing and not worrying about too much else. Um, journaling, I, I released my own book called The Anxiety Journal, um, which uh, I guess we can link to in the show notes or whatever. Um, theanxietyjournal.com is actually the, uh, the domain name for that. But um, yeah, that's if you think of the the five minute journal, it's like the five minute journal, but for fear and anxiety. So it's kind of like you do some gratitude exercises. It has a question in there. Like uh, the question is, what would you do today if you had no fear or if you weren't afraid? Um, mm. So it's again, it's those it's that micro exposure trying to get people to move towards what they want in their lives. Um, and and then other times I'll just get out a blank sheet of paper and just start writing shit down, like just this conscious stream of thought, what's coming up for me? What do I need to get out of my head and onto paper? Got it. Yeah. So what do you learn since um, starting your podcast? Oh, my God. I've learned loads of things. I mean, I've now done uh, 215 episodes of yeah. my podcast over a couple of years. Um, so I've learned from, you know, dozens and dozens of experts about different ways to uh, overcome anxiety and to interpret it. Um, I've learned how to be very creative in my life. And I kind of, I live my life through, often through a lens of like experiencing things myself, number one. And then number two is like, would any of this stuff that happened today be useful to my audience or to somebody else who's struggling? So I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of like consuming things and then I put it through the old Tim Collins sausage machine and then feed it to uh, people who need it and people who need a, a bit of inspiration right. or a bit of guidance or a bit of insight. And, and uh, so, yeah, I've built a huge amount of confidence. Um, you know, I, I think back to the first ever interview I did on my podcast. I was I was sweating and shaking then and I was thinking like – how fucking ironic is this that I'm talking about anxiety on the anxiety podcast and I am anxious, right? <laughs> Oof. But, you know, again, it's one of those things where people say that you we teach what we most need to know. Mm. And for me, going through the motions um, of doing that was a, was a big step to, to moving in the right direction. Um, the other point I'll, I'll make as well is that I think, I think every human being in some respect in their life is waiting for permission to start. We're always asking for permission to like, can I start my business or we need to ask a third party to, you know, change validated. our lives in some way or other. Yeah. Validation. Um, and so for me it was like, well, I'm not a doctor, so I shouldn't be talking about this. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I shouldn't be talking about this. Uh, maybe I should go back to school first and get some more education. Um, and I got permission from somebody else. Somebody said to me, you should just do it because people need to hear it now. They don't want to wait four years for you to get educated and then do it. Um, and so for anybody listening to this interview, you have permission by the fact that you're alive and you're breathing. You can do whatever you want. Don't wait. I started the anxiety podcast when I was anxious and I'm not anymore or not as much anymore. So sometimes you need to go through the motions of doing it to, to, to overcome it or to, to get to where you want to go. That's a, that's been a great lesson for me because now I know in my life when I'm feeling anxious or I'm scared about doing a talk to a bigger audience or whatever it is, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is, this means I'm getting somewhere. Mm. I'm on the right track. Definitely. And can, I can totally relate to that because I was the same way a few, um, a few months back and I've been putting this podcast off and off and off, just pushing it off mm. until, um, the first guest actually replied after about three months saying, hey, let's do this. And he scheduled a time. And I'm like, oh, shit. Now we got to do this. <laughs> yeah. uh, essentially, yeah. Let's talk about social media for a bit. Mm. Um, yeah. What's, 
What's your thoughts on that? Because in a way, internet allows us to connect、um, like never before. I'm able to connect to my family in Thailand, my friends back in Thailand, or people around the world connecting with you.、Um, yeah. Through the internet to do this podcast to have this conversation, but on the other end, it's almost separate us apart,、um, isolate us.、Yeah. What's your thought on that? I think、um, I think the internet and social media and all that stuff's fantastic, and I think also it has the ability to be abused.、Um, so I think it's it's a case of creating boundaries for yourself.、Um, And for a lot of people, that means that the first thing they do in the morning when they wake up shouldn't be to roll over and grab their phone and to start scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever the thing is for you. Because I think we need space in our lives.、Um, but then, at the right time or at a time when you want to connect and, and interact with people, then for sure, it's a it's an amazing tool to build a network and. Build relationships with people and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's you know for a lot of my clients again, it's a case of like let's create some better better boundaries around like the phone shouldn't be in your bedroom, it shouldn't be your alarm clock, it shouldn't be the first thing you do in the morning. And for a lot of people, at eight o'clock in the evening, they should switch it off and put it in a drawer、um, because what we've what we've created with with it is this constant.、Um, Constant requirement to be on,、um, and unfortunately, that means that you know we're always contactable. We're always getting little pings and buzzes and 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 that kind of thing.、Um, my phone's just out of here, out of view, and I I use the、uh, do not disturb feature almost all the time, so that my phone doesn't flash or ring apart from when I want to use it.、Um, and that's because I just. Don't want to be interrupted that much. So that's kind of like a high level thing. And then, you know, in a more specific case, you've got a lot of people online who are just spending too much time online and and seeing, looking at everybody else and saying, "Wow, everybody else's life is fantastic," and here I am, you know, taking my clothes to the dry cleaners or going to the post office, and God, aren't I boring? And so you have the whole FOMO. Thing going on and comparing yourself to other people, which again isn't a healthy, isn't a healthy human characteristic because we we're putting ourselves down by、right. elevating other people, right? And、um, yeah, we, and we always compare up. We never compare down. So it just yeah fe- have that feeling of being less than right. So and yeah, I, and I I I do agree with you on on the phone thing because I I mentioned the podcast before where. Just doing an hour of no elect electronics prior to bed actually helps improve sleep a ton, and it gives you that space. Kind of go back to that point that、um, we're so, I guess we're de- being demanded by the external world. Everybody wants a part of you, and if you don't kind of block out the time for yourself, then it's gone. It's eaten up. Like yeah, and I notice. That's for myself as well. Like if I don't manage properly, I, I don't block it off. I am at the dispense of the world, and over、mm. time, that creates my own anxiety. I I get stressed out and whatnot. So, yeah,、uh, I think it's like I think the other thing is that if you're a, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner or something, I think you know creating content and publishing it often is a good thing. Um, just don't consume all the time. Like, don't be scrolling through feeds of other people that it's irrelevant stuff. That's the time suck.、Um, so for me, like today, I put a podcast episode out. I'll publish it on Instagram and Facebook, and then、I'll, and then I won't go on again till this afternoon. I'll respond to comments and connect with people that way. But there's a kind of an intelligent way of using it so that you can get your message out and connect with your tribe of people, the people who are interested in your content or you're interested in theirs. But just the mindless like. Scrolling through stuff like that's,、um, uh, it's just it's more of a like a knee jerk reaction to open your phone and just start, and then next thing you know you're on some obscure website buying something or whatever because you've gone down a rabbit hole. So every time that happens, I kind of like, how did I get here? And and kind of question that type of behavior.、Um, but yeah, for some people, it's just saying, look, between if you just say right at lunchtime, I'm going to check. 
all my social media and then I'm going to leave it and, and I'll check it after work and then that's it for the day kind of thing. But what's, what's become more real is that every gap we have in our lives, whether we're waiting for the dentist or we're watching our kids, you know, tennis match or we're sat at the bus stop, like every single moment of spare time is filled with checking what everybody else is up to, then good luck being creative um, because we need to have space in our lives to come up with any original content or any ideas or anything that we want to do. So, um, you know, it's the same reason I don't really watch TV because I just, it's not that I don't like TV, I do, but um, I don't have a huge amount of time. And that bit of downtime in my evening, I'd rather be talking to my wife or reading a book or, you know, just hanging out as opposed to needing to fill every bit of space. And so TV's got upgraded to social media. Um, and some people will go all in and fill all their time with it. And other people will just use it as and when it's just the way it goes. Right. But what? I will say like I run in my, uh, in my business, I run retreat experiences where I take people away. And one of the first things I do on the retreat experiences is take people's phones and, and take them out of the room. And that, that freaks people out. They're like, what? I can't be, online it's like no i mean i don't they, they might check their email at night time but for the whole day that we're together over a few days there's no technology and uh people you know one of the ladies who came on my last retreat um she actually posted on facebook and said i'm offline for three days and at the end of the three days when the retreat was over she said to me i don't want to turn it back on again because she felt so liberated mm. so free creative connected ironically and uh yeah uh, that that's what people need to do is just try it like in your own life take a sunday where nothing's going on and don't turn your phone on mm. see if you can do one day the one day challenge right and then most people find it it's liberating for, for me uh, same thing like when i go out camping uh, it's no mm -hmm. service so you automatically just kind of shut it off and to me, I found that it brings me back to the present moment because yeah. I guess over time we, we become, we a creature habit, right? So we pick up our phones every time there's a downtime. So uh, right. I, I think that's the same thing with boredom. Why is it boring to you? Because the present moment is not good enough. You have to fill it with some other stuff that's more stimulating yeah. and it becomes yeah. addictive. So yeah. And one of the things I always think about, like, uh, I don't know who said it. It was on a, another podcast I was listening to, but like Facebook and Instagram and these things, that those platforms weren't designed to make you a better human. They were designed to make money for the company that invented them. Facebook's so successful because it serves up ads and all this kind of stuff and generates a lot of money. It gets a lot of attention. But by design, it's not like to improve you. That's not what it's there for. So as long as you go into it with that level of awareness and realize that they're a business and they're trying to make money um, and, and be a good product that's going to get your eyeballs and get your attention, then, you know, because without your attention, that stuff wouldn't work. Um, so, yeah, is it, is it, I, I always like say to people, like, once you finish looking at Facebook, do you get off and put your phone down and be like, that was fucking brilliant. I loved scrolling through that feed and seeing what all my friends are up to. It makes me feel so great. Probably not. Most people put their phone down. They're like, oh, God, I should be working harder, <laughs> looking better, feeling slimmer, traveling more uh, and all that kind of stuff. And so if that's the way it's making you feel, then, you know, just pick your moments. Yeah, definitely. Let's shift gear a little bit. What does, uh, do you have a ritual in the morning? Not really. Um, I do from time to time, but I have young children. So my ritual is like get up before the kids, make a cup of tea, um, kind of check out what I'm doing for the day and, and kind of check out my list. If sometimes there's meditation involved, um, I often take cold showers when I shower in the morning, full on cold to kind of change my state and wake my system up. Uh, I've done the Wim Hof method and stuff like that in the past. So I really like that cold water therapy stuff. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically it. I, it's spending time with my kids before they go to school and kind of getting the getting the day started that way. So, um, you know, often 
you know, journaling becomes part of that because I'll, I'll do my little to-do list. And as part of that, I'll, I'll look at my anxiety journal and do my gratitudes and stuff like that in there as well. But that's kind of my, how I get started. Um, always tea first. Sometimes I drink coffee, but I always start with tea. Got it. Yeah. What would, if you look back in your life, what, what book or who made the most impact on your life? Yeah, so there's a guy, um, an, a crazy Irish man that I worked with called Philip McKernan, um, who is, uh, well, he works with people. And um, I came across his work through through an introduction that somebody gave me. And um, he was somebody who uh, I've, you know, really enjoyed spending time with and working with because he asks very difficult questions. Um, a lot of people, I think, are there to appease people and pay them lip surface but for him it was like here's some difficult things you need to do in your life if you want to choose a different path um and again it was more like asking the hard question and then i would then go and implement the work um but yeah that would be somebody who's had a massive impact and then i've had a few other like mentors in business and in life in general who have been really impactful in terms of just doing the right thing and being consistent and putting the effort in and being patient and uh and probably my my best mentor ever is my mother um because my mom is a, a very compassionate empathetic loving person and um learn what i learned from her is um how to treat people and, and that kind of put me from a very young age into like wanting to help people um, and that's what I do now is, is, is to help people bypass some of the pain and get to where they want to go to quicker. Um, and so, yeah, my mom probably continues to be my, my biggest rock in my life in terms of when I think about tough situations, I think about how she would handle it. That's beautiful. Yeah. Philip's great. Uh, we've had him on too. So, and I actually got connected with you through him. So, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about tribe. Um, how important is it to, at least for anxious person, people with anxiety or even depression, to know that they're not alone in this journey? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, uh, I because of my backstory, I end up working with a lot of people who were like me. So I work with a lot of, you know, executives, business people, entrepreneurs, um, and in those industries and worlds, it, you know, it, it, people perceive it as if you're somebody who's going through anxiety, you would think like, I don't want anybody to find out about this because it's something to be embarrassed about. And so the first thing, um, whenever I get on the phone with anybody who's watched any of my videos or listened to my podcast, a lot of the time they're like, I'm, I'm so glad I found you because I don't feel like I'm a total outcast uh, it's good to know that somebody else knows how I feel. And I think that's why what I do works is because people come to me and they're like, I want to work with somebody who's been through it, not somebody who's theoretically understands it. Um, and I'm sure there's, you know, there's, there's clearly very good pe professional people out there who, who have learned about it in school. But for me, having been through it, I know how they feel. I know what keeps them awake at night. I know what headspace they're in when they say I've got intrusive thoughts or I can't concentrate at work or I feel like I'm going to throw up all the time. Like I, I get it. And so I think that additional level of compassion in addition to all of my skills, all of my, you know, understanding of how people can heal, um, means I have an advantage because I, I get the pain, but I also have the solution because I've, I've done it to myself. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we can just keep going for hours on end. I mean, I really enjoyed yeah. the conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I think we're going to start to wrap up here. Yeah. And um, I just want to acknowledge you for doing the work, right? Made that hard decision. And now you're actually helping other people shortcut their pain to mm. get to the solution faster so they don't waste time and effort and mental real estate on the things that they didn't need to. Um, so you're actually doing a lot of um, service for those people that need to hear your message. Um, the, and the inspiration that comes up for you may mean a lot to them at that 
particular moment in time when people mm. definitely need it the most. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. And before we part here, uh, the name of the show is called the Wellness Cafe. What does wellness mean to you? Wellness to me means um, putting yourself first in the world, in your own life. Um, again, something that's massively common in this world is is we put our kids first, our families first, and everybody else. And the truth is, is that without taking care of your own wellness, and that's what you eat, how you move, what you consume, who you talk to, what you do for work, where you live, who you love, if you don't take care of your own wellness first, then nothing else follows. Um, it has to be you first. So for me, wellness is about being selfish in a beautiful way. Selfishly selfless. Right. You got it. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for having me.